Hi guys, this is Mrs. Foy, and this is a screencast lecture for AP Biology, chapter 17 in the Pearson Biology book, From Gene to Protein. So the last lecture we talked about um, how DNA copies itself. Now we're gonna be talking about how DNA, the code in the DNA gets to the actual workbench where proteins are made. So how we go from a gene to a protein. So here we have an, an example of albinism, right? So a lot of mammals have albinism, humans have albinism. And so what we're gonna think about today, and we're gonna talk about this at the very end, I'm gonna make this lecture in two parts, part one and part two, because this is a pretty hefty uh, chapter. Um, what is it that, actually is the mechanism for albinism. So we know that um, there is um, uh, a mutation that is going to inhibit the synthesis of melanin, all right, which is a, a, a protein that is a, an important pigment in skin. But how exactly does that happen? So that's, that's what we're gonna um, come back to at the very end, all right? So, um, let's talk about the flow of genetic information. So we talk about um, how the information from DNA gets into actually making a protein, right? The protein are the workhorses um, of the cell. And it's the proteins that are the link between the genotype and the phenotype, right? So the genotype is the combination of alleles for that particular trait. And the phenotype is the physical expression. So it's proteins. And we know that DNA gets its information in kind of a middleman first, and that's called messenger RNA in a process called transcription. And then that information on the messenger RNA serves as directions for the cell to make the protein in a process called translation. So it's a very interesting history about how we figured this out, what genes actually do. And in 1902, there was a physician named Gerard that looked at a, a rare um, genetic dis disease called alcaptonuria. And this disease has the hallmark of having um, a, a black um, pigment be um, apparent in urine. Sometimes it's seen in, in diapers of children that have this disorder and sometimes adults. Um, and so we know today that it is a mutation in this particular enzyme that causes the buildup of this particular acid that causes the urine to be black, but also causes problems with um, bones and, and connective tissue and things like that in the person. So, but he was the first one, this Gerard in 1902, said that this disease was caused by an inborn, inborn mutation or an inborn problem in metabolism, inborn problem in metabolism. And so it took, um, these two scientists, George Beadle and Edward Tatum, um, in the 1900s to actually prove that. And their experimental organism was a bread mold. And by this time, the time that they were doing these experiments, they knew that if you just zapped living things with, with x-rays, or ionizing radiation, that it could mess up the DNA and create mutants. And what they figured out is this particular bread mold um, normally was able to survive on just minimal media. Media is like kind of the food that is given it. But the mutants were unable to survive. And so they hypothesized that um, there was a particular mutant, they could identify what protein it wasn't making. And they did this by this beautiful um, experiment. 
and they identified three classes of arginine deficient mutants. So this is an amino acid. And so they didn't have, each one had was lacking a specific enzyme necessary for synthesizing that. And so they came up with this one gene, one enzyme hypothesis that says that what a gene is, is that it is going to dictate the production of one enzyme. So this was their hypothesis they were working on. And so the link actually leads you to um, a really cool um, website um, that is all about DNA and I'll, um, I'll link it on the, um, on the actual uh, video. But this is basically what they did. So they, this minimal media had oxygen, sugar, salt, water, um, there was oxygen present for these particular bread molds, these neurospores. And what they did was they hypothesized that a gene would then dictate the production of an enzyme, which we know is a protein catalyst, and that it could um, make amino acids or take amino acids that were there, that were made there to make vitamins, and there would be growth. But what they reasoned is that they could mutate the gene then they could figure out which enzyme was not being made. And therefore they could see this by the fact that the bread mold wasn't growing, right? So that was their hypothesis. So what they did was they painstakingly took these different mutants and they figured out that there was actually a three-step process um, to making arginine. And there was a precursor that went to um, the first step that was um, orethine that made another, there was another enzyme that made citrulline and there was another enzyme that finally made arginine. And so what they figured out is they figured out if they could take these different mutants and put them on media that had that specific substance in it, then they could see that there was growth. If not, there wasn't. And so what they figured out is that the mutation um, that they had must break the enzyme, must mess up the code for the enzyme that creates arginine at the end of the pathway. And so this experiment was confirmation that a gene was dictating the code for a, an enzyme. But as we know, all proteins are not enzymes, right? They're structural proteins or proteins that are very important in the immune system. And so we have now, in modern times, we have adapted the Beetle and Tatum hypothesis to state that one enzyme, I'm sorry, one gene produces one polypeptide. And that's the hypothesis. Now I'll be a spoiler alert and tell you that we've already modified that again. But for right now, let's go with that one. Remember that proteins are usually a combination of multiple polypeptide strands in quaternary structure, okay? But sometimes we use polypeptide to be synonymous with protein. So you have to be careful about that. So this is what we call the central dogma of biology, that DNA is going to go through a process called transcription, where the genetic code gets rewritten on another molecule called a messenger RNA molecule. And then that code then gets translated or assembled into a specific amino acid sequence that's going to make the polypeptide. And that's going to be our protein. And there's some other um, little intermediate steps that happen in eukaryotic organisms that we'll talk about that makes it more complicated than what um, bacteria do. But the basic principles of transcription and translation is the transcription. So transcription literally means rewriting, script, okay, is the synth synthesis of messenger RNA under the direction of the DNA. And translation is the synthesis of a polypeptide 
which occurs, occurs under the direction of messenger RNA together with another type of RNA that we call transfer RNA and an, uh, another type of RNA called ribosomal RNA, which makes up the bulk of what a ribosome is. So in prokaryotes and bacteria, messenger RNA is produced by transcription and it's immediately translated, okay? There's no more editing or messing around with the piece of messenger RNA that was made in transcription. Remember that bacteria do not have a nucleus, all right? In eukaryotic cells, the nuclear envelope physically separates transcription from translation. Transcription occurs in the nucleus because the DNA never leaves the nucleus, right? It's protect inside the protected inside of the nuclear envelope. And so we have transcription going on in the nucleus of eukaryotes, and then the messenger RNA is going to leave through the nuclear pores, and translation occurs out in the cytoplasm. But the other thing that's different about eukaryotic transcription and translation is that the messenger RNA is processed or modified or edited. And that does not happen in prokaryotes as we'll see. So the basic flow chart that we have here is we have DNA can copy itself. We have DNA replication. And that's what we talked about in the last chapter, copying DNA right? Into more DNA, right? Before the cell is going to divide. In protein synthesis, we're talking about DNA being transcribed onto messenger RNA through the major enzyme called RNA polymerase. Do you see how this ACE enzyme is telling me what the subscript is, right? I'm going to be making messenger RNA. DNA polymerase is the major enzyme that's involved in making DNA polymers. And that's when we do DNA replication during the S phase of the cell cycle. And then finally, the last stage of the central dogma is translation, where we're gonna take that messenger A molecule and we are going to process it with the help of ribosomes and transfer RNAs to make an amino acid sequence or a protein. So the primary transcript is a piece of messenger RNA that is transcribed from any gene. In eukaryotes, that is edited. In prokaryotes, what you transcribe is what you translate. So there's no further editing of that messenger RNA trans, um, transcription. So here's just a picture of what's happening. In transcription in a bacterial cell, we just have one circular piece of DNA. That's our main um, source of DNA. Now we do have plasmids, that's true, but we're talking right now just about the major um, DNA source in bacteria. In eukaryotic cells, we have uh, a lot more DNA. We have multiple um, stick forms of the DNA that we call chromosomes. And those are housed in the nucleus, protected in the nucleus. So we have transcription going on to make a messenger RNA. We call it pre-mRNA because some changes are going to be happening to it. And we have something called RNA processing that we'll talk about later that changes the messenger RNA. It does not happen in bacteria. That's a big difference. And then that messenger RNA that has been edited and changed a little bit goes out to the cytoplasm where the ribosomes are and the transfer RNAs and the amino acids that they carry. And that's where the polypeptide is um, produced. So we are going to talk about bacterial transcription and translation, and also talk about eukaryotic. Just keep in mind the eukaryotic step is a lot more complicated. All right. So remember back when we were talking about DNA replication, and you guys remember that DNA has, because of its structure, it can only grow on the three prime end, right? Because that's where the little hydrox, hydroxyl groups stick down, and that's where the enzyme is going to add new nucleotides, right? So it's only going to get bigger in on the three prime end. Well, 
RNA is similar to DNA in some respects, but also different. So RNA is also a polymer. It is made of RNA nucleotides, which are made of um, ribose sugar, and they have phosphate groups, and they have hydroxyl groups sticking down off the third carbon, the number three carbon. And the bases that the RNA carry are a little bit different. They are adenine, cytosine, guanine, so A, C, and G, but thymine is a DNA base, nitrogen base, and that is replaced by uracil, okay? So a, messen a piece of messenger RNA is going to also have a similar structure, except it's only single-stranded, but it has to be built on the three prime end. And this is where it gets very complicated, all right? And I apologize um, on behalf of all biologists. One end of the DNA strand is what, what we call the template strand. It is the anti-sense strand and also the non-coding strand. This is the strand that is used as a guide to do complementary base pairing with the messenger RNA molecule that's being synthesized. The other DNA strand is called the coding strand or the sense strand or the non-template strand. The template strand can also be called the minus strand. And so sometimes you'll see different, um, you'll see different uh, verbiage for that and you kind of have to keep that straight, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. So what's going to happen is, is that we're going to use our template strand of DNA and we are going to do complementary base pairing. And the enzyme that is used here is RNA polymerase. And guys, you've got to keep this straight because otherwise you're going to get very confused with DNA replication, which has some similar steps. But now we're not making DNA, we're making messenger RNA. So RNA polymerase breaks the bonds on the hydrogen bonds on the DNA, and then it starts to synthesize from RNA nucleotides that are floating around in the, in the nucleus, if this was uh, a eukaryotic organism, and they're going to complementary base pair with the DNA on the template strand, the DNA bases on the template strand. So here I have, for example, TCG, on the template strand. And so my messenger RNA nucle nucleotides are gonna be built is AGC and the RNA polymerase cat um, catalyzes this. And then I have on my template strand ATT and I see that I have U, right? Because U replaces T in RNA language, UAA. So this is building on the three prime end and the RNA polymerase just moves down and this is um, transcribed onto a newly formed messenger RNA molecule. So this is really important and it's very cool. Which DNA strand is going to serve as the template for making the messenger RNA strand depends on which gene is being transcribed. Okay, so it's not always just one strand of the DNA or the other. It can go back and forth depending on which gene is transcribed. And the direction of synthesis is always going to be in the three prime direction. So this is the direction that is going to be growing. Here's my template strand on this picture. Here's my non-template strand. This is my coding strand. And one of the things that I want you to notice is because of complementary base pairing, you can see that the messenger RNA code is exactly like the code on the coding strand of the DNA, the non-template strand. So let's look here, except every time you see a T, you're gonna see a U in RNA language, all right? So let's look at this. Here on the coding strand is TTC, and then I have on my, um, my uh, messenger RNA strand, UUC, exactly the same thing. ACG, ACG, 
right? So it's exactly the same. And that's because it's doing complementary base pairing or opposite bases to the template strand on the DNA, all right? And this is gonna be in the three prime to five prime direction that it's reading here because it's building the messenger RNA always on the three prime side. So if we have a DNA molecule, we could see in this cartoon, I've got gene one, gene two, and gene three. And I have this turquoise kind of intermediate DNA in between that we're going to see is, is, um, is non-coding. But here I have my DNA transcribed to RNA and translated into an amino acid structure. So what I'd like you to do at this point is just pause the video and make sure that you can label all of these different um, structures in eukaryotic cells and make sure that you know what all of these are, okay? So pause the video just quickly and make sure that you can do that. So let's go back and make sure we know, okay? So here's the cell membrane, nuclear membrane, DNA, transcription, messenger RNA. This is the nuclear membrane here. This is the cytoplasm. Here's my messenger RNA. This, um, the red ribbon is the messenger RNA. This structure right here that looks like a little mushroom is the ribosome. And then this growing little um, orange bead is the growing amino acid sequence. So the genetic code, all right? So what is the actual code? Well, we have 20 different amino acids, but there are only four nucleotide bases in DNA. So what is the code for bases and how does that correspond to each amino acid? And we see that the code is actually a triplet code, all right? Three bases stand for an amino acid. Now, some of those codons, which is what we call three bases, are actually punctuation codes. So we have a start code that always encodes for methionine, which is an amino acid, that's always cleaved off at the beginning of every polypeptide that's synthesized. We have 61 different codons that encode 20 different amino acids, and it's a redundant code. So that means that you have more than one codon to represent an amino acid. And then we have three codons that are punctuation codons that stand for stop, all right? And so that's important, that's important to know. And so when you guys were baby freshmen, you learned how to read this chart, right? So here is an RNA codon chart. You have to look because sometimes you may be given the DNA codon chart. And sometimes I even saw one tricky test, they actually gave a transfer RNA codon chart. So make sure you know what the code is, I'll look at the paper and make sure you recognize what it is. So here's my start codon, here's first, second, and third messenger RNA base. Here I have my codons and you can read the amino acid abbreviations by, this is leucine, this is proline, serine, arginine. So those are the amino acids. So if I say U, 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 and U, U, C code for phenylalanine. This is another way that sometimes you see the codon chart and you can read it this way by starting in the center so G, 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 A, G, G, C, and G, G, U all code for the amino acid glycine, all right? U, A, A is a stop codon, but U, A, U, and U, A, C are tyrosine codons. Now, this one is not labeled, but I know it's an RNA code, right? Because I see U. And so I'm going to assume it's a messenger RNA codon sheet. So again, we have the template strand and the DNA coding strand. But remember, those are not always the same strand on the DNA because it depends on what protein um, you're synthesizing. In humans, it, it can be on either strand. So sometimes the template strand and the coding 
strand are going to be switched depending on which um, amino, which protein is going to be coded for. So we have transcription and then we have translation into an amino acid sequence that is dictated by the DNA code on the coding strand. And the DNA template strand is used to make be a template for the, the transcribed messenger RNA molecule. All right. So we call um, reading every three bases a reading frame. All right, and so you always read three bases. So we have code on one, code on two, code on three, and each of those are going to code for a specific amino acid. So the reading frame is going to be every three bases for either DNA or RNA. What is really cool about this is that the DNA code is basically a universal code with only some small changes. And so what that means is, some small differences, I mean. And what that means is, is that any living thing can read any other living thing's genetic code and can make, this, make the proteins that that code um, stands for. And so because of that, we can do something called genetic engineering, where we can take a gene from one organism and put it into another organism, and that other organism will read, read the DNA, transcribe the DNA, translate the DNA into proteins, just like if it was its own DNA. So let's go a little bit deeper into transcription now. So we've talked about this main enzyme called RNA polymerase. And again, don't be confused with DNA polymerase that's making DNA when the cell is getting ready to divide. So don't get confused about that. RNA polymerase is going to be hooking together RNA polymer uh, nucleotides into a messenger RNA molecule. It follows the same base pairing rule, except uracil substitutes for thymine. And of course, in prokaryotes, they basically have one RNA polymerase, while eukaryotes have multiple RNA poly uh, polymerases. You want to try to keep track in your notes about the differences and the similarities in transcription between bacteria and eukaryotes. There are three stages of transcription. Now, you may recall from the lecture about DNA, copying DNA, DNA synthesis, there were three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. We are now talking about making RNA, messenger RNA, and we have three stages, initiation to make the messenger RNA transcript, elongation of the messenger RNA molecule, and termination of the messenger RNA molecule. So make sure you keep straight with that in your notes. So what is basically going to happen here is that we see our main um, enzyme here, our RNA, RNA polymerase. And we're gonna talk about this thing called a promoter uh, later. But there's going to be a, a start codon that's going to tell us that this is where the transcription should start. And the transcriptional unit is the part of the DNA that's going to be transcribed into a messenger RNA. So initiation is just getting that RNA polymerase in the right space and starting this, uh, the synthesis of the messenger RNA molecule that's going to be read. Okay. Elongation is where, and it's not pictured in this cartoon, that you have RNA nucleotides that are floating around in the nucleus, right? If this is a eukaryotic organism, that are going to elongate this messenger RNA polymer, right? So it's got those RNA nucleotides that are building on the three prime end, because that's the only end that the nucleotides can attach to make those phosphodiester bonds, remember? And then we have termination. So there's gonna be um, a code at the end of the DNA transcriptional unit that's gonna say, this is where we're gonna stop transcription of the RNA molecule, and that's where it would fall off. Now. It's a lot simpler in bacteria, as we'll see, and a lot more complicated in eukaryotes, as we see. So the RNA polymerase actually parks 
at a place on the DNA called the promoter. All right. So the RNA polymerase, that big protein, it's an enzyme, sits on the uh, DNA at a place called the promoter. In bacteria, the sequence that is going to signal the end of transcription is called the terminator. In uh, and the stretch of DNA that is transcribed, we said, is called a transcriptional unit. So in eukaryotes, it's a little bit different, a little bit more complicated. And what is interesting is that the other major domain of living things besides the eukaryotes is a strange kind of, of ancient bacteria called the archaea. And their transcription and translation is eerily similar to our, ours, even though they're bacteria just like the U bacteria. So this, these regular, the U bacteria, as we'll see at the end, uh, has something different. But that's another reason why the RK bacteria domain are a, a whole separate domain. But I digress. Let's get back to where we're going here. So here's the promoter region. And one of the things that is the same in a lot of eukaryotes is something called a Tata box. And that's because, as you can imagine, it has a sequence of TATA. And that's not for all eukaryotes, but, but it is um, very common to have that. And so here is my RNA polymerase that's going to fit on my promoter in this promoter region that's going to be hallmarked by the Tata box. But we can also see that there are things called transcription factors, which are proteins. And we also see that there can be regulatory proteins that influence the positioning of the RNA polymerase, which is going to be very important. And then the protein coding region of the transcriptional unit is going to be a little bit downstream. And then the stop of transcription is going to occur at the end of the transcriptional unit for, again, for eukaryotes, it's going to be a little bit different than just a stop codon. So here is elongation. All right. So in elongation, I have just my RNA polymerase, which is this little thing that looks like a big triangle, adding free nucleotides to complementary base pair with the template strand on the three prime end. So I'd like you to try to just pause the video. If this is the template strand that you see right here, I would like for you to tell me what is the non-template strand and what is the messenger RNA strand. Okay, so make sure you mark five prime and three prime end of your DNA and RNA. So pause the video and um, I'm going to I'm going to reveal the answer in just a second. So pause the video if see if you can do that by yourself. So hopefully you got this answer. Here's the template strand. Here's the coding strand or non template strand. And here is the messenger RNA strand. All right. So at this point, I'm going to. Uh, in this lecture, this is part one, and then in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about translation. All right, so um, I hope that's been helpful, and I will see you in part two.